number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Weeks of economic and political turmoil in Sri Lanka have culminated into former Prime Minister and acting President Ranil Vikramasinghe taking the top office this week. However, this hasn't calmed demonstrators down for they accuse him of a stooge of dynastic Rajapaksa politics and do not see any transition setting in until he is gone too. As the island Sri Lanka treads through another week of tumultuous economic journey with no signs of immediate recovery or a bailout, the country's lawmakers come to a consensus on appointing Ranil Vikramasinghe as the new president of the country. Vikramasinghe will be in office until the next general elections due in 2024. His supporters, along with those who defended the Rajapaksa's governance, came out on streets to celebrate. Some said that he was the kind of leader that country needed in order to unite itself amidst a rapidly worsening situation. <laughs> Rate tahun na tahun yang kami benda sakit leno, apitnya, wilayah pasing, ada loko, perasaan ganan amat tiang te petelin netu apik an nanti ni, idiri a te an, apik alut benda sata anak etikaran te tiang. Jangan tahu apik ini lalne parana desa pal ni ni me, me pal me itu ekat ekatu ella, eva te katu tu kerana kai. The news, however, has not been well received by all sections, with those who sustained resistance made Rajapaksa step down, calling it mere an extension of the same rule. They are furious with the ruling elite after months of severe shortages of fuel, food and medicines and call Vikramasinghe's appointment a betrayal to the country. The ongoing economic crisis and political situation has taken Sri Lankans to extremes. No one knows what comes next. Observers say Vikramasinghe's appointment could lead to even more demonstrations in coming times and the country might be walking a tightrope. Today, while the parliamentary uh, election happening for the president, we are here as a protesters silently using our all good and positive vibes so that the right thing for the people will happen. Facing the challenge of soaring inflation and severe crunch of essentials, it has become even more important for the new leadership to tread cautiously in times to come. A successful negotiation with the International Monetary Fund might just be the beginning it seeks and needs. It is also incumbent on the leadership of the island nation to reach out to friendly and supportive countries like India and Japan that have pumped in over $7 billion since the crisis breakout. The government of India has also said that it will continue to monitor the situation in coming days and will provide different forms of assistance. India has given $3.8 billion assistance. No other country uh, has given this level of support uh, to Sri Lanka uh, this year. We wanted the, all the leaders, all the parties in the, uh, the country to appreciate that there is a very serious crisis in Sri Lanka, that the uh, situation there is unprecedented in terms of the, uh, what we are seeing, uh, uh, the, the financial and social uh, and political uh, consequences of that. It is a very close neighbor. Uh, so, naturally, the level of uh, concern as well as the uh, worry that there would be spillover uh, to India is there. Uh, you know, there are, in any neighboring country, if there is a, 
uh, instability or uh, that uh, there is uh, violence, it is something which uh, is of uh, deep concern to us. Meanwhile, the Sri Lankan story, which has become an interesting case study for countries around the world, continues to develop and everybody hopes that the island returns to its days of happiness and stability as soon as possible. Moving on, media freedom, among the other freedoms of expression, has gone for a toss in Pakistan. So-called Parliamentary Republic, Pakistan has launched a crackdown against anybody who has dared to dissent against the narrative set by a civil-military alliance. From punitive measures to direct violent attacks, the media personnel in Pakistan are living under a constant shadow of threat. Many of them have been forced to flee the country and live in exile and there too, they say, are not safe. Pakistan, which claims to be a parliamentary republic, is seeing a spike on attacks on the media, which has highlighted the looming threat to fundamental freedoms in the country. According to the World Press Freedom Index 2022 report, Pakistan has slipped by 12 points in the index from a rank of 145th in 2021 to 157th in 2022. The main purpose of media is to give a voice to the voiceless. Instead, communication outlets in the Islamic Republic have forcibly been transformed into the state apparatus that is being used to reshape the ideologies of the masses. If we see Freedom of Praise Index, which was published from very recognized organization, Reporters Without Borders, Pakistan's level is very low. The oppressive approach against media in Pakistan, which started under the dictatorship of Army General Ziaul Haq during the 1980s, continues today. Journalists critical of the military are often attacked, threatened or arrested and there is a long list of cases of intimidation of news reporters by army-related agencies. According to Freedom Network, an award-winning Pakistan-based media rights watchdog, at least 86 cases of attacks and violations against press and journalists took place between May of 2021 and April of 2022. Unfortunately, successive Pakistani governments, which are civilian facades used to conceal the iron fist of the army, are involved in crushing dissent and criminalizing dissimilar opinions. Even opposition parties who demand press freedom are the first to restrict it when in power. Just last year, noted Pakistani journalist Hamid Mir was taken off air for remarks he made against the military. He was later forced to apologize. Hamid, while protesting against an attack on another independent journalist, had threatened to expose the army's involvement in such attacks. Many media professionals who have been forced by the Pakistani army and intelligence agencies to leave the country are living under threats even on foreign soil. Several Pakistani journalists like Taha Siddiqui are living in exile but still don't feel safe and they have a reason to worry. Uh, journalists in Pakistan are constantly living under threat. Uh, they're living under the threat of uh, being kidnapped. They're living under the threat of being, you know, uh, uh, attacked, losing their jobs, uh, financial sort of uh, blackmailing that happens because they lose their job. Apart from the military, there are many other authorities and areas in the South Asian country which are out of the ambit of scrutiny. For instance, Pakistani media in conflict zones is non-existent. Hotspots like Balochistan, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa have become no-go areas for journalists, with information from these regions reduced to a trickle. Pakistan was never an easy place for journalists to work, but now the very existence of the media is under threat. Moving on. In line with its quantum leaps and fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, India achieved the remarkable feat of administering 2 billion vaccine doses this week. After its launch last year, the Indian vaccination drive, the biggest in the world, has accelerated with each passing month. And now, with government's emphasis on booster doses too, the country is set to achieve new milestones. 
people world over have praised the country's leadership and have thanked India for helping world in mitigating the spread. With the rollout of booster doses and people's enthusiastic participation in the government's inoculation drive, India touched the remarkable feat of administering 2 billion COVID vaccine jabs this week. Prime Minister Narendra Modi hailed the milestone, celebrating the world's largest and longest-running inoculation campaign, which began last year. The country of 1.35 billion people has lifted most COVID-related restrictions and international travel has recovered robustly. Some 80% of the inoculations have been the AstraZeneca vaccine made domestically called Covishield. Others include domestically developed Covaxin and Corbivax and Russia's Sputnik V. The federal government has also been accelerating its booster campaign to avert the spread of infections. मैं इस उपलब्धि के लिए सभी देशवासियों को बधाई देता हूं साथ ही मैं इस महान कार्य को सफल बनाने में जुटे हमारे सभी साथियों विशेषकर स्वास्थ्य और टीकाकरण कर्मियों को हार्दिक हार्दिक धन्यवाद करता हूं The government of India has been appreciated world over for its endeavors towards fighting the pandemic Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates too took to social media to congratulate Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Like other major international players, he said that the world was grateful to Indian vaccine manufacturers and the Indian government for mitigating the impact of COVID-19. While several countries across the world, especially a large part of Africa, has remained deprived of vaccines, India led the fight from the front and it not only developed its own vaccine and locally manufactured other vaccines but have supplied millions of them to the needy nations. This is a magnificent milestone. Magnificent milestone for India, a magnificent milestone for the world because we have vaccinated 200, given 200 crore doses to the people of India. And remember, we have achieved this using our own vaccines. We have been Atmanirbhar. Currently, citizens aged 12 and above are eligible to get themselves vaccinated against COVID. The 200 crore vaccination mark was crossed on Sunday, 18 months after the vaccination drive began. On July 15, the union government started with the COVID vaccination Amrit Mahotsav to provide free precautionary doses or booster for all adult eligible population at government vaccination centres for 75 days. Those eligible for the precautionary dose include all people above the age of 18 who have completed six months from the date of administration of the second dose. Time now for Asia this week, the stories from across the continent. Three years into Lebanon's financial meltdown, entrepreneur Tamara Hariri started a new online business selling bouquets made out of money bills. The 30-year-old said she started her cash bouquet concept a little more than a month ago in an attempt to offer an alternative for highly prized flowers in the cash-strapped country. It also gives those who want to help friends and relatives with cash a gift idea that is more acceptable to receive. The bouquets are made out of Lebanese pounds or US dollar bills, but more caution is paid when dealing with the hard currency. They request clients to send their own US dollar bills as they fear counterfeits and gently deal with those bills as their value increase compared to the Lebanese pound. Lebanon has been rocked by what the World Bank has described as one of the worst economic crises recorded. The meltdown has marked Lebanon's most destabilizing crisis since the 1975-1990 civil war, sinking the currency by more than 90%, plunging about three-quarters of the population into poverty and freezing savers out of their bank deposits.
While welcoming the move, Israel has said that implementing the opening up of Saudi Arabian airspace to Israeli airlines will take time. Prior to Riyadh's announcement, Israeli airlines could overfly Saudi territory to United Arab Emirates and Bahrain only. Dropping this restriction on access to Saudi airspace means they will be able to use it to reach Asia too. The US has been mediating on the expanded overflights, which would eventually entail direct coordination between Israeli and Saudi civil aviation agencies, even though Riyadh has yet to formally recognize Israel. Both flag carrier El Al Israel Airlines and a smaller rival Erkia have already applied for permission to fly over Saudi airspace, which would cut about 2.5 hours from flights to India and Thailand. Present routes to those popular destinations bypass Saudi Arabia airspace by flying south over the Red Sea around Yemen. Panasonic Holdings Corporation is progressing its Green Impact Plan, which is a solution to reduce CO2 emissions. In July, Panasonic HD Group CEO Yuki Kusumi articulated the action plan for 2024 with the target of net zero CO2 emissions to be achieved till 2030. 社会への24年度までに37工場へ拡大いたします。コントリビューションインパクトでは社会への削減貢献量を3845万トンまで引き上げます。スコープ3の領域ではクラシ事業領域での省エネを徹底し、オンインパクトで3145万トンを目指し拡大して
スプーン代わりとしてもあのお使いいただけますしあの食べても食感が柔らかいのと硬いのであの楽しめるかなと思って合わせさせていただきました。Visitors enjoy the beautiful scenery of Kyoto and eating the speciality soft cream of tofu and matcha. Next, we move on to India's southern state of Telangana to witness the annual celebrations of the Bonalu festival. Observed mainly in the twin cities Hyderabad and Sikandrabad, Bonalu is a famous Hindu festival in which goddess Mahakali is worshipped. Decked in traditional attires and carrying Bonalu on their head, women in Hyderabad city of Telangana throng to various temples of goddess Mahakali to celebrate the most auspicious Bonalu festival. During this occasion, Mother Goddess is worshipped in regional forms like Maisama, Pochama, and Yalama. Women make an offering of bonum, which is prepared using rice cooked with milk and jaggery, along with turmeric, vermilion, bangles, and sari. Some women are even said to face a spell of trance as they dance with balancing pots to the rhythmic beats of the drums. In the honor of Goddess Mahakali. Temple ko jaake, Bhagwan ko bonam chada ke, ajje se pray karte hain ki hamare pradana sunne wo. Celebrated in the month of Ashar, Banalu is a reflection of Telangana's rich culture and traditions. During the processions of the festival, a colorful paper structure which is supported by bamboo sticks is also brought and offered as a part of the ritual to show devotees respect to the deity. Observed on three different Sundays at different places in the twin cities, Hyderabad and Secunderabad, the festival's origin traces back to the 18th century and till date it is observed with same enthusiasm. Bonalu in uh, in Telangana are a very special uh, festival. They are uh, very typical to Telangana. They are a native uh, festival of Telangana people. So every Bonalu has a lot of history. If you take this Mahankali Bonalu itself, it has a history of over uh, 250 years. When uh, in, way back in 1843, the police battalion uh, which had gone to uh, Ujjain on admission. They had uh, prayed for the plague uh, affected people here, and it had stopped next day. So, the battalion commander had brought back the idol and placed it very much here in front of the police chowki, and since then, it has been celebrated. Intended to ward off evil and usher in peace, Banalu festival is also considered a thanksgiving to the goddess after the fulfilment of vows. Bonalu festival is the light and soul of Telangana state describing the intensity of human emotions through the vibrancy of performances with that we come to the end of this week's episode see you next week goodbye and take care